ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my channel, Nursing Education Tutor. My name is Cheryl Spencer. Let's see who's coming on tonight. So it's Tuesday night and somebody has an exam tomorrow. I know for sure. So let's see who's coming on. I have a little notebook, notepad, take some notes and see what's going on. Let's, ooh, I think I have a visitor, ooh. Let's see who's coming on. So let's say happy Tuesday and um, let's see who's coming on. Welcome. I'm gonna type in the chat until I see some other people come on. I see someone. Introduce yourself. As I'm here chatting, typing. Don't be shy. Type your name in that box, in the chat box. I know who's here with me. Well, it's Tuesday, and rumor has it that um, a certain school that I know, the senior students are having their exam tomorrow on Med Surge, and I'm quite certain there are other, other students, other schools having an exam. There seems to always be some sort of an exam on a Wednesday. Who came up with Wednesday? So hence Tuesday night, um, you should be relaxing. I highly doubt it. You're probably studying, reading, doing all those adaptive quizzing. You know, you know they're not, not plugging anyone, but we all know who the adaptive quizzing people are. And, you know, my only tip to students on that is it's not about how many questions you do. Of course, um, it's not about quantity. It's really about quality. So with adapted, adaptive quizzing, now they will give you, they'll start you off on a, on a lower level, a lower competency and an easy question. So if you answer a couple of easy questions to the point that they're satisfied that you can move to a higher lev level, they adapt the quiz according to your presentation, your ability. The goal is to not do so many questions. Your goal is to do enough questions that will get you at a higher level. So the instruction I give students in tutoring is that if you, it's open book, you're home, you're not being tested or you know, wherever you are, uh, you get to a question, a test item in the adaptive quizzing, whatever the company the software, and you don't know the answer. The guidance is open your book, Google. Whatever source you get your information from, get it and answer the question correctly. Because until you answer that level question adequately to satisfy them, you're still going to stay at that level. And remember, the goal is to answer enough questions to get to uh, a higher level. And I'm sure your educator, instructor, has a level that they want you to achieve based on whatever standards were set in that. I'm just going to adjust the camera because this is cutting my head off a bit. Um, yeah, so, so with adaptive quizzing, you know, the night before your exam, you hopefully should have done all your reading already. Now, nursing, reading for nursing courses, it's really, it's a lot. Um, it's manageable, but you have to plan ahead. And I know people have their jokes, you know, by the time you start class, you're already behind. You know, tr try not to focus on those negative ways. Try to plan. I have an hour to read today or have an hour to read in the morning. If I do have to go to work, we, we do recognize that you have life. Another hour later in the day, uh, maybe you're going to read in the morning, I do case study at night or some, some type of, of strategy. But, you know, reading and rereading sometimes isn't the best way for everyone. And, and you know how best you study and how, how well you learn. 
uh, learning for a lot of students and it's really about how you process things, how, how you store them. You know, what, what means you take a complex thing with a big fancy word such as hyperlipidemia. I mean, who walks around and say that three times? And find a way that you can process it. Low cholesterol, high cholesterol, happy cholesterol, lazy cholesterol, you know, HDL, LDL. You know, there are different ways that, you know, you can come up with or you hear another person or if your teacher is a creative, innovative type of person, they may lead you to some type of means to, to process, to understand, to store, and then later the ability to retrieve it that you can demonstrate it either in a physical sense, such as a lab setting, or to uh, demonstrate your competence, your cognitive ability on a standardized test or your faculty created exam. So that's kind of where you are, big fancy words, big fancy terms for, <laughs> you know, you gotta study, you gotta learn, you gotta figure out a way how to learn it and perhaps how you processed it and, and learned and studied. Um, in your pre-nursing courses or even in a fundamentals course may be a, you may have to find a different way as you move further in the nursing program. So if you're listening and you happen to be one of the senior students who will be taking your med surge exam tomorrow, all the best. All the best with that. I, I would expect that in a senior level, you're almost ready to be a graduate nurse entry level in the profession, you know, it's not about skills so much anymore. You've, you've had those. It's, it's about clinical judgment, decision-making, critical thinking at its highest level, priority, putting it all together. It's not, you know, which of the following I have the nursing assistant do? Oh, we've been down that road. We're talking about now you have four, four clients with four different criteria. And of course it's, they're going to involve, involve, um, high level um, comorbidities, a patient with multi-system failure, um, and you have to decide what do you do first. That, that's, that's nursing, that, that's good nursing, that's excellent nursing. It's not do, 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 I mean, you know, there, nurses, there, there's always something to do, in just about every profession there's something to do, but what make you um, a practitioner, an excellent nurse, a caring, safe, all, those um, necessary components to make the health entry, health um, existence of a patient safe and the best outcome involves those things. You have to be professional. You have to be quick on your feet. You have to be able to prioritize. You have to know what can be done later or what will never get done on your shift because it's 24 hours. And those are the types of things that you must uh, be able to do. So there's a little to uh, chit chat there. So uh, somebody, uh, you have your chat box. Let me know who's here with me and tell me what's going on. Let's see, don't let me do all the talking. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but you know, don't, don't let me, don't let me do Don't let me do all the talking. Say hello so I know who you are. Um, real quick, I told you my name, it's like patient identification. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Spencer. I'm going to be a nurse today. Can you please tell me your full name? And you pause, give them a chance to say their full name and your date of birth. And then you verified in the band. But this is what nervous nursing students do. Can I tell you full, can you please tell me a full name and date of birth? Poor patient didn't hear a thing that you say because you're so nervous. So you calm down. Exhale a bit. Inhale and exhale a few times. You know, you can address the time of day. I mean, if you're going to say good morning, and then later you're gonna ask the patient, so what time of day it is? Patient goes, well, it's morning. Well, you kind of told them. So, or if you're gonna go in there and say, good morning, Mr. Brown. Well, you already done told him what his name was. So when you go ask him later, can you tell him her full name's like, you know? So it takes a little time uh, in humans. So even the whole salutation, sir or ma'am, you make no assumption as to what the person claim identify, but you know, we. We're creatures of habit and creatures of our, of our socialization. So uh, I'm sure in, in most cases when I see somebody who fits the overt description of what I've been socialized in my life to be male, I probably say, sir, but I'm trying my best not to make those, um, um, I don't even call them mistakes, uh, those assumptions, basically. I, I, I'll, I'll let you tell me um, who you are. 
and, and that's what patient identification is. So it could be, but I do, I do do some type of salutation. The sun is up, it's daytime. I don't expect a patient to tell me, oh, it's 10.55. My patient's there in pain or in some type of respiratory disorder. They really could care less what time of day it is. They want to know, um, you know, are you bringing anything to help them with relief of the pain or help them <laughs> increase their oxygen saturation, beat night, beat day. So most of us do use some type of a daytime salutation, you know, when you talk about that. Thank you, know, good morning, sir. Morning is, you know, the sun is up. Um, how are you? Um, my name is Cheryl Spencer. I'm going to be your nurse today. Can you please tell me your full name? And you know, most people don't ask full name, but you know, meaning the patient may even tell you one. If they just say, my name is John, then you say, yeah, but uh, could you tell me what your last name is? You, you need to have the full name. And then your date of birth, and you know, some people are reluctant to talk about their age. And again, you have to use uh, soft, s strong soft, if that's, if that's such a thing, if that's such a thing. Um, you know, I asked you your uh, full name and date of birth. It's one of the, it's two of the measures we use for patient identification for your safety. Um, any medications or treatment that is ordered uh, for you, we want to make sure that only you get that. And, the, and that's the purpose of that. And I always prompt the patient to tell them, and when I come back later in the day to do another treatment, I'll be asking you that question again. So you just kind of prepare them uh, for what they can, um, can get later. Okay, so I think that's all I'm doing about the chit chat. So I see about, I'm not going to count numbers because my ego may shot it, but can somebody type in the chat so I know who you are and maybe ask a question? I decided to put a little, little green today. I normally don't wear green, um, but um, it's my high school color. So I try to have the school logo on there, but um, I'm going to put a little green in the background because it's just too, too much of a shadow. But um, yeah, money tree. Let's hope some money comes. Let's hope some money comes off. Who's that? Hello, professor. Um, yeah, who and who are you? What's your uh, okay? You don't have to put pull your full name, uh, but uh, do you have an exam tomorrow? Are you are you one of those fortunate people who happen to have an exam tomorrow? Good luck. I hear that it's it's med surge, I believe. Um, I was uh, looking on a channel. Uh, there's a, a professor. I was very flattered that she actually came over and um, former student. Oh, so you're a nurse? Hey. Congratulations, congratulations. Um, yeah, congratulations, that's awesome. So uh, there's some students um, listening here. Well, hopefully there's some students listening and some of them will definitely have an exam tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely have an exam tomorrow. So it's, I, I know of one school that they're having their senior exam. Can you give them a tip? Can you give them a tip of something they can do tonight? Twas the night before the exam. So can you give them a tip of something that they can do the night before the exam to help them? Or, or something that helped you? Let's see. Did you leave me or maybe maybe you're not in a position to, to, to chat? Well, let's go through some of the tips uh, while I wait for somebody to put something in the chat. Let's see. I would suggest to learn more math formula. What? In, there you go. Learn more math formula. Um, oh, I guess because, um, you mean more like IV formula or, oh, okay. Um, more like IV, more like IV formula. Um, or you're talking about a dimensional analysis, ratio proportion, that type of stuff. Um, but I, you know, I like math, so I always tell people to really, really get, get, you know, get, you know, get their math together. You know, g give it a chance. You know, sometimes people, they talk themselves out of it, saying that they don't, they don't like math, and they don't give themselves a, ch a chance. Because honestly, I think most of the nursing, uh, we shouldn't even call it nursing math, to be honest, because because it is just math. But many times, a lot of the math, it's really, it's fourth grade math, <laughs> you know, it's fourth grade math. I know sometimes I say that, and for a lot of people, it's not, it's not reassuring. It's not reassuring, but it's, I try to tell them it's fourth grade math, not to, not to frighten them or to, 
it's just to encourage them that you know it's not calculus you know you know it's it's not calculus it's something that can be learned you know if you have a 10 year old home <laughs> they can help you help you with it but um you know we don't do the you know johnny has a pizza pie with eight slices if johnny ate one johnny gave one to their friend how many slices i mean it's, it's not going to be that you know like that but it could be something similarly similarly simple i'll say that three times you know it's something like you know the provider orders i don't know let's uh an antibiotic the pro the provider orders uh but i do have an exam tomorrow oh fundamental well, oh. Oh, Shayna, hold on, Shayna. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you, because I'm, I'm a bit partial to the fundamentals, Shayna. So I got you. Hold on a minute, boo. Hold on, hold on a minute. <laughs> so the provider orders, um, and call, call, call your other friends on, Shayna. You know, t you know t well, call. I'm, I'm aging myself. Text your other friends. Tell them to come over. You know what to do with all that button, because I'm about to give you some fundamental tips. Call them real quick. Tell them, come on over. Because, <laughs> you know, education should be, educ I'm looking in the chat box, education should be just this. I, a professor at one school, should be able to be in a platform like this and just talk for a minute. And if a student in another school benefits, great, and vice versa. I think we need to share. Sharing is caring. But back to that simple math. So the provider orders antibiotic B, 500 milligrams. Pharmacy <laughs> sends up antibiotic B, 250 milligrams. You know, the question is gonna be, well, how many, um, hey, Sharita, oh, yes, girl, how, um, how many pills should you give? What should be two? Hello, yes, yes, Sharita, we need to talk about, um, so right above you, Shana Hill is a, um, from a different, uh, don't go to my school, but that's fine, it's okay, but you do have an exam tomorrow. So do you see, now, now do you see the method to my, um, not madness, that almost all nursing school, we act like we're so different, but we're so similar. Why does everybody have an exam on Wednesday? And sure enough, here's um, Shayna. So Shayna, if you're, this is your first exam, if this, if this is, but I do have an exam for fundamentals. Is this your first exam? If this is your first um, fundamentals exam. And since I don't, well, let's see, it's October. It's either one or two. I mean, I mean, how many exams could they have given you poor students already? So it's probably either one or two. So let's see what a typical fundamental exam is. And since I don't write your exam, I could say my second one. Okay, good. So second one, I'm trying to figure, did you, you did professional issues already? So you learned all about your profession, about who gives you permission to do what, the a and a the state, your license, uh, what's the difference between you, a potentially you, and, an, and a UAP, an unlicensed assistive personnel. Um, you probably learned a whole bunch on asepsis. I mean, it's been, you know, COVID kind of makes it a little confusing because we're wearing gloves now where we normally wouldn't wear gloves. But, you know, we're, oh, your second one. Okay, good. So your second one, let's say you've moved up, you've moved up to... Um, Shayna, text me, tell me, tell me some topics of your lectures. So give me, give me, give me a lecture topic and I, I probably could help you that way. I'm so happy you're here. That's excellent. Good. So let's see, we had professional issues. We had asepsis, fire safety, uh, mobility. Those are the stuff on the first exam. Um, probably a little delegation. So I'm figuring your second exam is now moving into some sort of um, systems. Could be elimination maybe, could be some fluid, could be some electrolytes, because that goes a little bit, uh, for our school, at fluid and electrolytes is exam number three, but for some schools it could be exam number two. So uh, we usually, um, our second exam is, let's see, Sharida, <laughs> let's see. Our second exam, Sharida, let's see what I have in exam number two. Oh, what's my notes? Exam number two, um, well, again, mobility comes up again, of course, with elimination. Oh, oh so watch, so Sharita, watch that, um, yeah, so watch that video on uh, urinary elimination. I was supposed to make a bowel elimination, which I still need to do one. So 
you know, when it comes to systems, farm, ooh, pharmacologist on this one too? Yeah, okay, good. So some of that could actually be in Shana's exam as well. When it comes to systems, you know, whether it's your, when it, when it comes to your urinary, um, lim el urinary elimination, the exam, oh, there you go, urinary, whoa. Okay, I got you, I got you, girl. Since I don't know what's on your exam, <laughs> lab valve. Okay, wait a second. I love it, Shane. I love it. Let's see. Let me put this down here before we go. So let's see. Oh, periopto. They put so you have urine, bowel, periop. Wow. Documentation info. Okay. So I think Sharita. So so Sharita and Shane. I love SS. And um, so back to what I was saying about both. Uh, urinary and bowel elimination in order for you to know that something's abnormal you kind of sort of have to memorize normal so you must and by normal nor first of all normal for what looks like acts like a human so what's normal for a human but then it has to be individual so for instance you learn from anatomy and physiology and um um what a normal amount of urine what what urine should look like so this is what I want both of you to write down uh, Shana and Sharita you need to know the minimum and students get get confused about this it's not that we're happy with it but you need to know the minimum amount of urine a human being should put out for kidney function and that minimum is 30 ml per hour so you want average human to put out meaning an average human i don't know nothing about them i don't know what they drink whether they were there on a chug 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 gallon of water all day or they're just sparsely drinking. did i just do chug you know regardless of their condition minimum you want a human being to put out 30 mls per hour now you memorize that because what you're going to get is you're going to get some type of an intake and output and what you're going to need to look for any output that's 30 times 24 do the math right 30 ml per hour times 24 hours that individual must have put out that minimum and it's important to understand the minimum because of course I'm not happy with 30 ml per hour, but the 30 ml is just a good sign that the kidney is working. Now what's going to make that 30 ml much more is based on what the person drinks, right? So it's really important when you do your intake and output, you're looking minimum for that person to put at a minimum of 200, 30, three, six, you know, 720, whatever that is. Multiply 24 by 30, and that will give you the minimum amount of urine you want to put out. But your intake and output, of course, you know, lecture, we lecture, it's a perfect world. You know, your patient takes in two liters, and the urine is supposed to put out two liters. Baloney. It does not come out equal. Of course not. Because we lose water in ways that we cannot measure right? You know, you drink, some comes out in your bowels. Remember, it comes out in your bowels, especially if you have diarrhea. If you have diarrhea and your colon isn't reabsorbing all that fluid, you're going to lose some water there with some other stuff. And you hyperventilate. We talk about insensible loss and sweating. So, but you want it to be as close as possible. You don't want it to be so off balance where the, the individual is taking in so much fluid and there's just a small amount in the output. So before you can, so at minimum, ladies, at minimum, in your output, you want to see if it's, if it's 10 hours, I want to see minimum 10 times 30. 300 ml. So at minimum, I've been okay. The patient has minimum 30 ml per hour. So their kidney is working, but now let's evaluate how much they're putting in. All right. You then need to understand some of what, I mean, what normal urine looks like. I mean, like really, you know, of course the more dilute, etc. Um, you know, with regard to, um, teaching a patient about urine. So some of the stuff we're talking about teaching, 
you know, you know, when you're in these professions where you're working long hours and you're so busy, sometimes, you know, we forget that we need to go to the bathroom, but you want, it's, it puts you at risk, greater risk for urinary infection because of, uh, you know, urine stays in the bladder. You don't want any urine stasis. Some puts some people at risk for developing stones. Some it doesn't happen overnight, but you want to teach your pay, you teach your patient, your client, whenever you feel the need to go to the urine, you should go as soon as possible. Same thing for all of us. And of course, wipe front to back. You then should, so that's kind of normal. So then you need to understand what's abnormal. I mean, you know, no, I mean, abnormal smell, a foul smell, high smell, signs of an infection. Um, what else? Cloudy. The urine looks cloudy. You know, when I make urine, and yes, I make urine, I make urine. I'll take um, lemonade, little, you know, like little lemonade, or I could take iced tea powder, make it really dilute, and then tip a tiny bit of yogurt in it, and that makes it cloudy. So cloudy urine could be a sign of infection. Um, color, that's right, color. We talk about straw color. I'm trying to figure what I have here. This is kind of dark. Oh, look what I have in my house. A Foley catheter. I mean, this could be the color of a urine. Look at this. This right here could be a color of a urine. This is too dark. And I know I have a Foley catheter in my house. That's stuff I have here. But so you want to look at the color. I'm going to talk about lab values, but Charita, you can talk. So the, the two... The two main lab values for urine assessment is your urinalysis, a urinalysis and a culture and sensitivity. Now, ladies and ladies, this is where students get confused sometimes. Um, your urinalysis is a clean technique. It, it's clean. It can be clean. Uh, culture and sensitivity has to be sterile because what you want, I want to test the bacteria that's in coming in i don't want the bacteria on the outside so you should be able to know the difference um for exam uh shana if there is some sort of um how to collect how to collect a urine specimen i i think that's an important question as a fundamental student how would you instruct a patient um to, co to collect a specimen a clean catch. Know what a clean catch is. No midstream urine. That's what I would talk about urine and about the amount. I think that's enough. Um, oh, so that would be a clean catch. Exactly. A clean, but you know what happened in, in the doctor's office? They kind of confuse you because to be honest with you, a sterile urine is a clean catch is considered a sterile urine. So a clean catch is considered a sterile urine, but there's another way to get urine, and that would be like with a straight catheter with a whole sterile technique. So in the big scheme of things, you should study that, yes, you a uh, clean catch, you can get a sterile urine midstream. So you'll instruct the, the client to clean themselves from front to back. They start urine, let some of the urine drop into the toilet, and then catch that sucker midstream. So that's technically a sterile urine. But if you're doing a memory, which of the following urine specimens require a sterile technique? Culture. Okay? A urinalysis does not require, but could, could it be sterile? Of course, but it doesn't have to be. So urinalysis... Culture and sensitivity. So remember, culture and sensitivity, talking about bacteria. So I hope that helps. Uh, you, should, you should understand besides color and the amount, what's uh, other normal urine, such as um, ketones, abnormal. Ketones, abnormal. So, uh, so ket we don't do dipstick at the bedside. Joint Commission doesn't want any bedside testing. But a patient who has diabetes... Right, a client who has who's living with diabetes, it's important that you know we we determine if there's any ketones in there. Ketones turns the uh, strip purple, so ketones is a sign of fat metabolism, end product of fat metabolism. The reason why that's important for individuals with diabetes, when they have high glucose either because they're, the insulin is inadequate or they're just being diagnosed, the human body will resort to fat metabolism because you do not need insulin for fat. So individuals who lack insulin, 
Most times there's ketones and product of fat metabolism in their urine. So, I mean, that's probably, that may not be in your exam. It's kind of up there on the high level, but it's important. Normal urine should, so normal urine should look straw colored. You should know what the pH, um, I'm sorry, P, uh, P, specific gravity, um, should know what the specific gravity is. Um, the lower the number, like 10, 10, 10, 05, it's dilute, 10, 30, 10, 35, more concentrated, those types of stuff. Now, again, with regard to urine, uh, because urine uh, comes from the kidneys, in addition to looking at the urine labs, Miss Sharita, I would definitely want to look at their BMP. I want to look at the sodium level because the kidney filters, filters, regulates electrolytes. So I would left to want to look at the sodium level. I want to look at the potassium level, especially if they're on which medication. I want one of you ladies tell me there's one medication that every fundamental student should know that when your patient is getting this medicine, you want to check their potassium level. I'm going to wait for it. Because I think one of you do. It's really important. Cue the Jeopardy music. Da, 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 da. You should know this. Oh my goodness. Da. Come on, people. Type that sucker quick. Unless you're driving, don't stop to type. Which medication, common medication, um, that you must check the potassium level prior to giving? I want to hear it. Come on, Charita, don't let me have to come and get you. <laughs> Shane, are you still with me? Okay, since you're all so shy and I don't want too much um too much quiet noise. That that's enough thank you. That oh yes! Yes, <laughs> you, yes, you, you, you wanted those newbies to say it. I know it. I, <laughs> there you go. Okay. So look above. There's one, uh, a nurse helped you guys out. Furesemide. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So good. Shana. Good. Furesemide. Memorize this ladies. Lasix. Memorize this. Lasix, 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 water pill, water pill, water pill. Your patient's going to ask, I have my water pill. One of the main issues with furosemide or the other name is lasix is that the patient can lose their potassium so i'm not as a as a, as a professor as a professora i'm not going to ask you i mean i'm saying this to you very simple right now that was so dramatic cheryl look at that yo <laughs> i wouldn't ask you with like you know um which of the following medications make you lose your potassium mm -mm. i expect you to know that I expect you to know that, so I want you to memorize that. This is what I would ask you. Your patient is being discharged on furesemide. Write that sucker down. <laughs> Your patient is being discharged on furesemide. Okay, all right. So, so yo, I've moved up. I'm discharging patients. I'm moving right along. Your patient is being discharged on furesemide. Which of the following instructions should you include? Bam. And one of those instructions is going to instruct them. I won't forget. <laughs> I won't forget. Good. Excellent. So your patient is being discharged on furosemide. You have memorized. Oh my God, furosemide. It's a diuretic. It's a fast acting diuretic like the patient cares. The patient just knows it makes them wet themselves all the time, makes them rush to the bathroom. It, 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 it gets rid of the potassium. You need to teach that patient to include foods with potassium. <laughs> right? Exactly. So your patient is going home on furosemide. One of the instructions would be to include foods with potassium. So what foods are there? You got to learn. Banana. Banana, number one. Banana, tomatoes, some dark green leafy vegetables, sweet potatoes. So, so look, look at, I'm going to give you all some homework. 
Patience, go. You're going to look up furosemide. You're going to look up furosemide. And then you're going to look up a normal potassium level, 3.5 to 5. Look up furosemide. Look up a normal potassium level. And look up foods that are rich in potassium. So, Shana, since you got your test tomorrow, I'm telling you, girl, if you get a question on the test like that, I'll be like, yo. <laughs> um, so, especially with... Um, especially with urinary elimination. Now back to that, which, which may help both of you. So um, incontinence, um, I'm sure we'll talk about some type of incontinence. Um, I, I don't want you, you should have to memorize them, but a patient, a patient says every time I cough, it seems like I wet myself. That's stress incontinence. Uh, a pregnant woman, you know, that baby, that cute little miracle that she's trying to bring to this world, Kicks, huh. wets herself, stress incontinence, <laughs> stress incontinence, um, urge incontinence. You feel the need to get there, but you just don't make it there on time. Urge incontinence. Um, so those are some of the things that you talk about when it comes to incontinence. If I do, thank you. I hope so. I hope so. So look over. If, if I were closing my eyes and trying to think about urinary, and I was, bowel elimination is, is, you know, I'll talk a little bit about that, but urinary seems to be more of a crisis because it has to do with, you know, blood, how fast your blood filter. If you have edema and you get Lasix to try to get it out. We seem to spend a lot more time on urinary elimination because it has so much to do with kidney function, blood pressure, cardiac output, stroke output. But... If I were to, if my night before the exam, this is what I would look myself in the mirror, Shana, and this is what I'd say. Well, um, urinary elimination, let's see, for a norm, normal urine, it should look yellowish, uh, straw color, and never been on a farm, so what does the straw look like? But if it's too light, too dilute, that means the patient's either drinking too much, a, a lot of water. If it's on the darker side, the patient's not drinking enough water. Um, specific gravity should be anywhere from 1010 to 1030. 1010 is on the dilute end. Um, on a normal to test kidney function, an average human should put out 30 mLs per hour. I'm happy. I'm satisfied that it's kidney function, but ideally I would like more. So I want to look and see what the patient is taking in. If the patient takes in two liters, ideally you want it to come close. It's not going to be perfect because of some insensible loss, either from vomiting, diarrhea, hyperventilation, stuff like that. I want to look at the patient's urinalysis. Normal human beings, there could be a little bacteria in the urine and that's normal, a little bacteria. Blood in the urine is never normal. Ketones is never normal. If I see ketones, I want to ask the patient if they're diabetic. Have they been on some diet like the Atkins diet? Um, if it's female, I want to ask them if they have their menstrual period. That could be a reason why there's, there may be blood in the urine. Um, if your patient is on intake and output, because you know sometimes people flush the toilet before you go or they spill stuff, the best way, the best way, is to pull my ears, the best way to monitor intake and output, weigh them. The scales don't lie. Weigh them today, weigh them tomorrow, daily weights. So, and one of the main medications that affect urine is diuretics. Now, um, furosemide or Lasix is a, is a potassium wasting. There are medications um, that holds on to the hold on to the potassium. So memorize furosemide Lasix that makes the potassium go. Later on, you learn about another one called aldactone, and that also that that does the reverse. So it it doesn't matter what medic any medication that gets rid of water from the kidneys. Check the potassium. Okay. Bowel elimination, same, similar thing. You have to know what's normal. What's normal stool? What's normal? Normal color, normal shape. One of the main things that you must ask your patient, how often do you move your bowels? Patient may tell you once a day. Is that a normal pattern for you? Good. Patient tells you twice a day. Some people, that's normal. You need to know what's a normal for that patient, but you also need to... Um, Look in your text and see what your instructor tells you. At what point are you concerned? 
how many days of not having a bowel movement are you concerned? If I have a patient, and at what point it's called constipation, right? If I have a patient who moves their bowels once a day, patient goes every day, it's now Monday or today's Tuesday, patient didn't go today, I'm not panicking. I'm gonna ask the patient, was any, has anything changed with your diet? Did you, oh, I didn't drink as much water today. That could be it. I didn't eat as much fiber as today. That could, that could be it. So cup, before you conclude about the patient's pattern, you want to ask them, has there been any change in their um, intake? So what goes in comes out. Now for healthy bowels, you know, I call it the three F's. Y'all better quote me on this one. The best thing for a healthy bowel is Cheryl Spencer's three F's. I like the F word. I find ways to say it all the time. Fluid, fiber, and fitness. Those three F's will get your bowels. Exercise, the intestines, muscle, those marathoners. Sometimes they have diarrhea during the race. Believe me, you look it up. It happens. So fluid, adequate amount of water, helps um, lubricate, helps, uh, you know, soften your stool and help it go out. The colon reabsorb that. Um, fiber, high fiber foods, both soluble and in insoluble. You cook some, raw some, a variety of fiber helps your diet. And exercise, of course, you're not going to the Olympics, you know, you're not. Michael Phelps or Usain Bolt, but or my girl Serena, but um, fitness is, is really, really good for your diet. So, and again, so you need to determine in, in most places, we'll tell you if a person has not had a bowel movement for three days, they'll call that constipation. But look in your textbook to see what specifically they say about that. So, if the patient doesn't do well, they may put them older individuals will probably be in a stool softener. So, I gave you one medication for um, urinary um, furosemide. I'll give you one medication for bowel elimination. So colase, docosate sodium, it's a stool, it's classified, it's classified as a laxative, but I want you to be very, very careful. It's not going to make you go whoosh. What it does, it softens the stool so you don't strain and have that Valsalva maneuver that can drop your heart rate and, you know, somebody's calling 911. Hey, my husband's sitting on the commode and can't move. It happens, believe me. So a patient is like, why are you going to give me this pain pill? Um, it's to help soften, you know, your stool. As you get older, one of the normal signs of aging, some decrease in motility, GI motility, and um, docosate sodium uh, colase is one of those. But again, I'm trying to have them increase the, increase the fiber as, as well. And I think that's on those two. Let me just go back on. Um, so, okay, so bowel elimination. Shayna, I told you, I got you, I got you, I got you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna so let me talk a little, just a little bit about periop. I think I'm gonna do periop and then we'll wrap up. So under per, periop, a uh, couple of things. A patient's going to surgery. The periop uh, phase begins the moment they decide surgery. So the minute the person, of course, you, you don't want that, you don't want that pre-op to be that long before surgery, but peri-op, so it's peri-op, the moment they determine surgery, pre-op, right before they get into the OR, intra-op, which I spend very little bit on that because not a surgeon or nurse anesthetist, and then post-op. So hopefully your teacher, instructors spend most of their time on pre-op and post-op. Some key things about uh, pre-op. You're gonna do most of your teaching, a lot, I should say, well, uh, a lot of your teaching pre-op. You're like, why? You're doing a lot of your teaching pre-op because when your patient comes from surgery in pain, not fully oriented, this is not the time to go start to teach them something new. You teach them pre-op so post-op, when they're still a little bit kind of groggy or a little bit pain not fully managed, you can say, remember when I spoke to that, yeah, 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 I'll do whatever it is until I get my pain medicine. So you're going to teach them things pre-op. Here are your issues with surgery. First and foremost, you have to understand, Miss Shana, for your test tomorrow, who can consent for surgery? It's an informed consent. It goes back to professional issues. What is the legal age of consent in your state? 
What is the legal age of consent in your state? Okay. I mean, you can consent to have a boyfriend, but you may not be the legal age of consent. <laughs> legal age for informed consent. Mental status. A patient with dementia cannot sign an informed consent. So if the person does not fully cognitive, you'll have to get their next of kin, be it husband, wife, or healthcare proxy. Um, patient who has received mind alter. I, I know, I don't want to say trick, but that's kind of usually a question. Patient is, is getting ready for surgery. Patient is um, extremely anxious, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to surgery. I'm like anxious. Patient received a narcotic anti-anxiety. Straight up. Did I, right there. The minute that patient has received that narcotic, mind altering, they can't sign consent. See? so the, the And again, very often pre-op patient would, would get some type of an anti-anxiety. Um, you know, so if the consent needs to be signed before that. Um, oh, a patient takes that all the time. No, patient received a mind altering drug. They cannot take, they cannot sign informed consent. So Shana, I got you. Remember that you need an informed consent. It can be signed at any time. I mean, they've signed consents right on the OR table, but then again, that's before they give them any mind altering drugs, etc. So look up who can sign consent, informed consent. Do not resuscitate. Patients, you should know what a do not resuscitate. If patient is going to surgery, do not resuscitate is off the table. Because guess what we do with anesthesia? Basically putting them somewhat close under. So look up with do not resuscitate. So that's really all I focus on. Um, well, I mean, in pre-op pre about who can sign consent. And then also the stuff that you teach them. So you teach your patient um, um, splinting. The patient may come back. Of course, a patient may come back with an abdominal incision. And if they have an abdominal incision, you want to teach them how to put both hands directly over the incision or use the pillow. And what that does is help to prevent when they start to cough and deep breathe to help prevent that incision from opening up. You want them to cough and deep breathe because you don't want those shallow breaths that can possibly cause, um, cause any type of post-op pneumonia. I'm going to teach the patient that you often teach the patient leg exercises leg exercises that's going to help them prevent any type of um, emboli help and some type of mobility um, your teaching pre-op really helps the post-op um, intra-op i tell you, i do not spend a lot of time down there some students if you're fortunate you do get a chance to go there um, some don't especially now you should understand the process of timeout Anybody can call timeout. I mean, you don't have to be like so dramatic, like a timeout, like it's a, it's a sports game. But anytime there's any uh, potential confusion, um, anything unknown, potential for harm, you can call a timeout, um, reevaluate the situation, re-identify re the patient. Timeout can be called at any time. Post-op. So in a post-op, your post-op, um, again, airway always comes first, you know, so, but there's some main uh, concerns post-op, um, you know, when do you progress? The, uh, well, let me get to die. Pain, well, breathing, pain, uh, a reorientation, and later um, how you progress your diet, bleeding. So, you know, you know put, put, put the following post-op issues in order, you know, hemorrhage, breathing, you know, diet, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's back to the fundamentals that you learned, but on a higher level now that you're trying to get them. I, I, I know it's really full. I can't believe you're getting peri-op so soon. I'm just getting rid of this out of my, my thing here. And let's see, that was, that was a lot of talking. Um, let's see, Shane, let me see Shane. Let's see Shana got for me. Let's see Miss Shana. Uh, let me go back over here. Nope. Uh, I'll do. So, um, I don't know. I, I wish, I wish you well, you know, you know, documentation, Shana, document, documentation rather to me, it, it, it always goes back to about how do you, uh, document, um, object, objectively, objectively, um, say for instance in S bar, or how do you document subjective? The patient says, I don't feel like doing anything today. Yeah, that's what you write. 
Shayna, I know you let you see, Shayna, you see that the same way I'm talking right now is exactly how I lecture. My hands go up there. I try to do, if it's something really, really important, I'll pull my ears. That's just kind of, I mean, you do it for a long time, but I, I hope, um, I hope it, I hope it helps. Um, so I'm trying to figure, so, um, so I just want to give Shayna some tips because her exam is tomorrow. So again, documentation, you know, documentation again, it's talk, it's talking about, you know, it's objective data versus subjective data, whatever the patient says, put it in quotes. Don't try to edit their, don't try to edit their statement. Patient said the food sucks. Yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> um, patient, um, you know, we wanted to patient verbalizes displeasure. Hey, patient didn't verbalize no displeasure. Patient said the food sucks. That's what that means. So, you know, of course, you know, we don't want to do it for profanity, but I do a nurse that would write the profanity. Um, but just do that documentation. Now, communication real quick. Um, communication real quick. Don't make any assumptions about uh, about culture. You should try to understand understand culture. But, okay, so one guy from Armenia um, doesn't, you know, one guy from Armenia does one thing. Don't make any assumption that every guy from Armenia does the same. So uh, culture and communication go together. But if you're talking about communication on a fundamental uh, student level, uh, think about your population. If it's an elderly population, they have variations in hearing. So how would you talk to somebody who is hard of hearing or we're a hearing aid? You stand in front of them speak in a normal voice. I want to emphasize that. Speak in a normal voice, stand in front of them, because many times people can lip read. You don't have to be deaf to lip read. Stand in front of them. Don't do this. Don't exaggerate your movement. Speak normally in a normal tone, but just stand in front of them so they can combine both what they can hear and what you see. If the person has a hearing aid, please make sure that it's there. Um, communication can be written communication. Um, so, or give them stuff to read. So when you do your health um, assessment, you know, we ask these patients these questions like, why do I want to know what grade level? You know, you want to know what level of competency um, do they like to read as opposed to watch a video? Send them over to my channel. <laughs> um, you know, it's just certain things like that. And, and I hope that helps. Um, so I, I think so. Um, Shayna, I, I hope that helps. Um, I really hope that helps. I'm trying to figure what else. Um, definitely, you know, for elimination, for bowels, and even for peri, definitely my, my Fs, you know, for, you know, fluid. You need to assess their fluid, assess their fiber, and their, and their fitness level. And like I said, you know, we're not trying to get them to the Olympics, but we just want them to, to move, um, to just move a bit. And what, what are the lab values? Okay, so, oh, while you're back on periop, so periop, especially with incision, um, Shayna, you should be, um, it, we're talking about surgical asepsis, right? So we're talking about surgical asepsis. Uh, you want to look, you, you know, if the, you're not going to see a sign of infection day one post-op. You know, to be honest, you know, day one post-op, a patient's temperature could actually be a little bit above, you know, a little bit 99, 100, you know, because the human, because the body was cut. That's just the body's normal response. A couple of days later, you know, when you start to look at, you know, drainage, you know, you know, if something's different. So, Periop, you have normal drainage, Shana. There are three types of normal drainage. Cirrus, it's like lemonade. You know, like you get a blister, you get like a little burn blister and it pops. It's, it looks like water with a little bit of color. It could be yellow lemonade or a little pinkish lemonade, but it's clear. Cirrus is clear. Then you have sanguinous, like sangria sanguinous it's bloody patient just came from surgery you expect a dressing to be bloody that's normal the other one is a combination of both serous sanguinous those are your normal signs so if it doesn't look clear like clear with a hint of color bloody bloody sanguinous or combination those are the three normal drainage so when you pick up your dressing and you look and you're going to say, oh, 
it's approximately 10 cc's of sanguinous dressing. That's another thing. Um, another thing we of, often ask, Shane, is this my last thing on periop? You know, it's important to check the bed linen, especially if a patient has had major abdominal surgery with a big incision. If they're lying on their, black, on their back, if the wound is draining a lot of drainage, that drainage may not show up on the dressing. It may just trickle back to the back. So it's important to turn that patient to look to the back to assess for drainage. And I think that's all the tip I have for you because I see a, a text coming in some business. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that, who's that? Yes, it does. I haven't looked, but you have a video for the nursing process. I do. I think I do. That's on that too. I do. I do. So Shana, keep coming, you know, share with your friends, tell them to come over and, you know, send some tips on how I could do it for you. You know, you know, again, to me, this you know, education should be as free as you, you, you can. It, it's just, it's just a good capital. And I, I think most, most teachers want you to do well. And, and I want you to do well because one of y'all going to take over my job because I do want to retire one day and be chilling Netflix and chilling in retirement <laughs> or whatever. Um, yes. All right. So late. Okay. So let me end it. Let me end it how it is. Um, you know, you know, thank you so much for coming. Um, if this is your first time to my channel, welcome. I hope you stay. Have a good day. Be good.